Welcome to the Web Platform Podcast, a developer discussion that dives deep into all things web. We discuss topics relevant to developing for the modern web and the web platform of today, tomorrow, and beyond. Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Web Platform Podcast. The fifth web developer caved, and now we are the number one podcast in the entire world. I am one of your hosts this week, Justin Ribeiro, and with me as always, Mr. Danny Blue. Danny, how's it going out there? It's uh, it's going pretty good. It's raining. It's been raining for two weeks. I'm very sad. My my psyche can't take much more of it. But it, but other than that, know, I lived in time. Seattle for a long time, and that was just you know it rained all the time. And you, know, you just learn to deal. I, I don't I don't I don't like it at all. I will say that I can appreciate that uh, Prince died two weeks ago, and it's been raining ever since. So. So we so so we've got that so we've got that as well. Cue the Prince music at this point. We don't have license for that. The producers tell me we don't have a license. So Danny, what are we talking about this week? Uh, so this week we are talking about we are going to be talking about Cypress IO. We do have uh, we have one. I don't even know if we want to uh, call her a guest panelist or just a, a new regular. Um, you uh, last week we had her. Uh, we had her on talking about um, talking about System JS, but uh, we have uh, Mel Hussein back with us. Hey, hello. Awesome. So, um, and this was actually um, off of based off of her recommendation, but um, we have. Uh, but so we're going to be talking about Cypress IO, and we have um, a couple people who um, we are assuming know more about Cypress IO than we do. Um, so first off, we have uh, we have Brian Mann, who is the uh, creator and founder of Cypress IO. So say hi, Brian. Hello, everyone. And we have Gleb uh, with a last name that I can't pronounce, and I uh, didn't want to insult him by destroying it. But uh, Gleb, go on and say hello. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. No problem. So really. You know what is you know what has become the for pretty much for any developer podcast talking about stuff we don't know talking about things we're assuming people don't know we have to ask the first question of what is Cypress I/O and what problems is it trying to solve? Um, Brian, if you wanted to go ahead and tackle that, sure, I'll take it away. Great first question. Well, um, I'll say that uh, Cypress I/O is both a tool and a next generation service, and it's built around trying to solve the hardest problems that we deal with as web developers, uh, building applications that are ultimately delivered uh, to the browser. Uh, we believe that the existing tools that are mostly built around Selenium really just don't work for the way that we approach development these days, and uh, and this is a tool that is just fundamentally different. It's architecturally very different than what Selenium provides. Um, and it's been built from the ground up to work for developers uh, and allow them to much easier uh, test their web applications. Ah, sorry, I was on mute. Um, perfect. Um, so my, my first question along those lines is that is this a like a, a deployed or installed solution to something like um, to something like Selenium, or is it a, uh, a more of a cloud service or tool? Um, it's it's really a hybrid of both, and um, you know I'll I'll just say that solving testing uh, is is a very very difficult uh, problem to solve, and uh, and I, I believe it requires sort of a multifaceted approach. And um, really, Cypress, the core of what users are using right now, is just a, a desktop application. So it's something that you're going to install on your local machine, that it's going to be running there in the background. And, uh, and really, that's sort of the replacement to a Selenium server, per se. Like, it basically does all the magic in the background. Uh, you'll go in there, you'll launch projects, but then you'll work entirely in the browser, which is obviously, as a web developer, what you're comfortable uh, doing. Um, so we have like this really great experience where it's really simple to get broad projects up and running, to write your first test, and uh, and to develop and test at the same time inside of Cypress. But then when you go to sort of manage your tests as you write an ever-growing number of them, uh, you'll want to run them in continuous integration. And uh, that's actually where our service cuts in, and uh, we are actually spawning browsers in the cloud. We're doing things like recording video, taking screenshots, giving you access uh, over VNC to basically spawn instances on demand. 
and uh, and then record all of those results and then feed them back into the desktop app. So it's sort of like one complete circle uh, that is really hybrid. It's, it's both. It's both a local and a remote experience. Perfect. That um, I think that answered any question I I would ever have about that specific thing. But no, that sounds that sounds really cool. Um, so you've mentioned just we've said the word testing a couple of times um, already, and I just wanted to point out that when we are talking about testing in this case, we are talking more about end-to-end um, -end testing versus unit testing. Is that correct, or is it both? Um, I mean, right now, I would say it's it's end-to-end -end testing and integration testing. Um, I think okay. we'll we'll get more into this. Unit testing is also something that we're trying to solve. Um, that requires something that's a little bit different than, than what we're offering right now. Um, and it will, all, it will only ever solve unit testing when it comes to code that is delivered to the browser. For instance, you know, when you're writing your backend services in Node or another language, uh, we're never going to touch that area of unit testing. But for you know, React code or Angular directives or things like that, that traditionally uh, you would potentially write a unit test around, um, if it's being delivered to the browser, we're going to be able to do that as well. Okay. Um, and uh, Brian or Gleb, either one of you, uh, feel free to answer that. But so since we are talking about, we said so focusing on this like end-to-end uh, -end and integration testing, can we just go over really quickly for anybody that doesn't know what those are, what end-to-end -end testing is, what integration testing is, and how it is different from unit testing that maybe more people are familiar with? Brian, do you want to answer that, or I can answer that? Oh, go ahead, Gleb. I think uh, I think you can take it away. Excellent. Uh, so, unit testing is literally testing a particular piece of code in complete isolation. So, think you wrote a function in JavaScript, and then you just give it a bunch of inputs, and you make sure that the output is what you expect them to be. Uh, the code runs in isolation. It should run very, very quickly. Usually, you don't interact with uh, DOM or databases. You mark or stop them. You literally want to you know, really quickly run all your unit tests. And this is great, right? Like, if you're a developer, you just sit there at your local laptop, and as you change the code, it just reruns the test right away, and you know right away the code is broken. On the other hand, once you build a library, it usually has to work with uh, data, has to work with the browser. Now you're talking about end-to-end -end testing, right? Is your website working? Right? Is your website talking to a database? If you enter you know, user ID, does it actually find your user? So now you're talking about a deployed website, and you want to test that. And you want to test it almost as if the user was using it. So another um, name for that is also functional testing. You know, does your website function as you would expect it? And this is a much harder problem, because you cannot do it quickly. You have to have uh, usually everything deployed. You cannot stop. Uh, you have to go through a user interface layer. You can't work directly with data. And, and that's you know, a much harder problem. Uh, I've written myself unit testing frameworks. I've used pretty much every JavaScript uh, unit testing framework. And, and there are a bunch of great ones, like Mocha. But end-to-end, -end, so far, has eluded even you know, people who have been thinking about it a lot. Hope it answers the question. Yeah, and so Gleb, I think um, can you maybe walk us through? So you're, uh, you're, um, I mean, so I Cypress is, is a fairly new framework, and um, and and you you're an early adopter, and and so can you maybe talk a little bit about um, how you've been using it, and and I think why you chose to use it, and what problem it's solving for you? Oh, absolutely. So I'm not part of a Cypress team. I don't know Brian personally. I only know him through Twitter and internet. I've seen, I think, Cypress kind of demo video, kind of teaser, a long time ago, and I thought to myself, well, this is very interesting. Because in my own you know, development life, uh, I'm working at Kensho, which is financial startup, and you know, we do a lot of testing. And I've been doing testing with pretty much any framework or any tool you can imagine. So we started with Phantom for end-to-end -end testing, which is a headless browser. A and it was very clunky and had lots of bugs. The you know kind of interface was not great. Uh, there is a wrapper on Phantom called Casper, so we switched to Casper. Also headless, also very clunky, hard to work with. Then we switched to uh, Selenium cluster, so we're actually running real browsers and we're controlling them through Java. 
And you know, it's cross-browser solution, but it's, again, clunky, very flaky. You have to maintain it. Someone has to make sure everything is working. So right now, we're working with a Selenium cluster through Protractor, which is a library from Google for end-to-end -end testing, which is geared towards Angular apps, yet it still, you know, you can test any app, really, with that. And yet, I was never happy. And so when Cypress actually started open beta program by invitation a couple months ago, I, you know, I got an invite because I signed up a long time ago, and I looked at a video that Brian has done, and I was just, this is exactly what I want. Like, this kind of abstraction around working with UI, very natural API is exactly what I want. So I started testing uh, my own open source projects. And I tested uh, server-side rendering code, like simple to do MVC, and I, and I just loved the experience. I, I, I was up and running in literally five minutes, and any time I had a question, I literally either looked at the docs or at the example, and I knew how to do it in a minute. Uh, then I decided, well, there is no way Cypress is good for testing a JavaScript library, because I had a little you know, pop-up library that was JavaScript, but had to interact with DOM, because there was no server, but again, Cypress just surprised me by just loading plain file, finding all the right JavaScript, and, and being able to work. Uh, recently, I tested a small Cycle.js web app, and again, it, it just blew my mind, you know, how natural to a developer the API was, how intuitive it was. And I'll give you an example, and, and Brian, you know, props to you. So. In my web app, I had to enter a couple of values and then, you know, take the focus away from a text field, and then, it, you know, the web app would actually know that I want to compute. I'm done with entering stuff. And so, you know, I use, like, Cypress, find field, enter something, and then, like, well, it hasn't done anything because it hasn't triggered blur event. Okay, how do I trigger blur event? And I was like, well, I bet Cypress just, you just do dot blur method call. And it just worked. Right? So it was like the API was so natural, I could guess how to do things. And then you know, I read the documentation, and like, I'm really happy Cypress user. And um, just to, you know, so I could remember myself and trying to promote it at Kensho, I wrote a blog post about Cypress. And um, it got quite a few you know, you know, views. And I think more people now know about Cypress uh, and what a great tool it is. So that's my story with Cyprus. <laughs> that's great. Yes, thanks so much, Gleb, for uh, for writing that. That's uh, that's what we're going for. Just uh, really happy users that uh, want to go out and share it. So Amal, I have to confess, uh, my internet flaked for about thirty seconds. So it picked up right when Gleb was just in the middle of talking. So I kind of missed the question, but I think I got the gist of it. Yeah, that's not a problem. I was I was really just asking him about what pain what pain points it solved for him, and you know, and why his experience so far. Um, you know, and so I guess I guess for me, as as someone who writes day to day in JavaScript, um, you know, there's a lot of fatigue around new, right? And so one, if, you know, one more JavaScript framework I have to learn, I'm going to have to quit my job. So so I guess how hard is it? You know, to kind of start using this, um, and I'm I'm also really interested to know what the developer um, experience is like. Uh, you know, because obviously this is a framework written by developers for developers, right? So, um, and, and I know that you were trying to solve many of your own problems when writing this. And so, is it is it a what's the upstart and the um, ramp up time to to get to get started with this? Yeah, great question. So, I mean, I will just say that um, really from the get go. Cypress has been built around sort of adopting uh, the most used, the most loved uh, existing JavaScript tools and sort of building, uh, stand on, standing on their shoulders. Um, I mean, I am a JavaScript developer. I've been in the space now for eight years. Uh, even prior to doing Cypress, I did a different project um, called Backbone Rails where I basically got a chance to do screencasts about teaching uh, developers all over the world about using Backbone and Rails when those were sort of the two hottest things. And, uh, and I, I really got a chance to interact with, you know, much more than just my field of vision for the developers that I, uh, you know, worked with on projects at work. And I got a chance to talk to, you know, hundreds of different developers all over the world. And I think, I think we all identify with 
the, the problems of testing. And um, I, I mean, I'll, I'll just say that all of the APIs of Cypress is sort of built to, um, to extend your existing knowledge. Like, it, and it could be as simple as, you know, uh, to Gleb's point about how natural the API uh, felt. I mean, we, we've sort of, you know, taken a lot of methods from jQuery, you know. Most developers these days, if you're a web developer, you pretty much know the jQuery uh, DOM traversal methods uh, by heart. And, you know, we sort of just baked all of those in there to where there's no surprises. Um, we, I mean, one of the biggest pain points of developers uh, is, is just getting started. And yes, like JavaScript, JavaScript fatigue is just something that I think we just naturally have to combat because it's, it's just going to continue. You know, there's just going to be more innovation into this space. And I think that, you know, when you're building a product, you have to take that into account. And so one of the things that we wanted to do is, is basically reduce the mental effort that it takes to, to, to basically learn about uh, Cypress, for it to sort of peel and reveal slowly sort of the intricate details of really what's happening. So, you know, when you're, when you're using Cypress, you know, like to, Gleb, to Gleb's point, you can basically get up and running in less than five minutes. Like we automatically seed your project. Um, with an example spec that really demonstrates all of the usages of Cypress's API to where without writing a single line of code, you can at least see it working. You can, you can get through those first hurdles um, and, uh, and sort of and slowly experience the API. Um, and um, I, I, I mean, it's such a central goal of ours to just, to just have, uh, to, to really work for developers, to really make them happy and productive. And so, you know, we've written literally, not, not exaggerating, hundreds of custom errors for basically every typical situation that you might think would work or that you go down. There's, there's probably an error that catches you and, and even, you know, dissects how you've written something and tells you the exact way to rewrite it. Um, we just, we just want to create that, that type of experience. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, you know. So far, so far, it seems like we've done a good job. Thank you. Yeah, no, yeah. that all that all sounds really, really good. Um, go ahead, Gleb. Uh, can I add something? Uh, just to get back to how easy it is to bootstrap a project. So you, from my experience, you start a Cypress binary, which is like a little proxy server that you install once on your laptop. And then you just open the folder with your project that you want to test. And if a project doesn't have Cypress, you know, tests, then Cypress will create initial setup for you. That's it. So as soon as it sees a new folder that it doesn't recognize, it will bootstrap you. It will add the example test so you know how to use it. And it, you can start running right away. So it's literally not even five minutes. You know, with a good internet connection to download the binary, probably one minute. That's pretty great. And and Gleb, I can't really tell. Are you a fan of um of Cypress or not? I I can't I can't I can't really tell. So I'm a huge fan. I'm not affiliated. I don't get any you know benefits or financial rewards for saying that. Uh, I'm just fed up with the current state of testing. Uh, yeah. I've read, I've written testing tools myself that became popular, especially for Angular. And I know what a pain point it is. I recently worked on our Selenium test, and I spent days trying to optimize API, make it more promise returning, make it more natural. And so whenever I, when I saw Cypress, like this is exactly what we're trying to achieve, and you solve so many problems that we're trying to do ourselves. Yeah. So you you have, you've both mentioned that you know that something like this is diff it's difficult to do this isn't an easy problem to solve but why is this end to end testing so difficult like why why does something like cypress need to exist yeah so um, i guess i'll go ahead and take this one so th this is a great 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 question and it it has a very technical and long answer um, so when you are doing true end to end testing you basically are testing on top of the world as it is. You, you really cannot reach in, you can't control things, and certainly when it comes to browser testing with, with you know, the way that Selenium actually works and automates the browser, it's, it's basically like you're outside of the fence and you're throwing commands over, but you don't really know what happened to them. 
I mean, you, after you throw them, then you have to subsequently sort of ask, well, what is the state of things? Where are you at now? And because of that, there's just this enormous amount of unpredictability. When it comes to modern JavaScript applications where, I mean, if you really just think about the DOM, it's a giant mutable object um, with rich interactions and, 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 uh, and complex things going on. It just means that you'll never really truly definitively know. And because of that, this just, that just creates an inherent uh, amount of flake and, and brittleness to where even if your test pass once, uh, if you run it again, given a different set of conditions, it's, it's going to fail. And I, I will almost just say that it's sort of like in order to solve end-to-end -end testing or to make it easier or better, you basically don't do end-to-end -end testing. And, and I know that that kind of like sounds like a cop-out. It's kind of like, wait, what? I thought you write end-to-end -end tests with Cypress. And you can. You can still basically seed the database. You can sort of set up the world as it is and then do things that simulate user behavior and then poke at, poke at the DOM basically and figure out whether something happened. But what is so fundamentally different about Cypress is that it lives inside of the browser. It is the exact inverse of the way that Selenium works, where Selenium is on the outside and it's throwing remote commands over the fence and poking at it. Cypress is the opposite. It's actually inside of the browser. It is the thing that is controlling your applications, and you control it from the inside. And because of that, it, it runs in the same uh, run loop as the browser, and therefore, when anything happens, it is synchronously notified. And therefore, it is able to basically pass or fail or predictably act no matter what 100% of the time. And the other huge advantage that we have of living inside of the browser is we have access to every single object. Like if you just want to tap into your window object, you can. And that gives us the ability to do all sorts of amazing things. We can begin to control the environment precisely. So I mean, you can still use Cypress to you know, not touch anything, not, not modify any host objects. But you can also use Cypress to just mock out XHR requests. Like if you want to simulate things like delay from your server, you know, uh, you know, maybe your page remotely uh, grabs data on load and shows like a loading spinner until those things. You can use Cypress to test every variance of that state, of a long request, of a short request, of a request that sends back a server 500. And you don't, net, you don't need to actually force the world, uh, you don't need to force your server, I'm sorry, let me back up. You do, not, you do not need to seed your database or create the conditions that cause your server to do that. You can just simply tell it to do that, and it will automatically intercept those requests and basically create that result. But what, what we do in doing that is we're basically no longer doing end-to-end -end testing. We're actually basically sliding down the ruler, down the pyramid, away from end-to-end -end tests and closer to like integration and unit tests. And it's really just up to the developer who's in the best position to be able to make those decisions. Like, you know, when you're testing logging in, you probably don't want to mock anything. You probably really do need 100% confidence that everything works through every single layer. But then when you're, you know, working on other features, like if you want to test pagination or something like that, it, it's sort of ludicrous to think like, oh, and I have to like seed hundreds of records in a database in order for my server to send the results I want. I mean, that, that's, that's insane. Just, just, just mock it. Force the, res force the request to have the payload that you want, and then test the side effects uh, that way. So that's sort of the long story of why end-to-end -end testing is hard and some of the things that Cypress does to solve that. You know, and a, lot, a lot of times when we talk about end-to-end -end testing, you know, it's this idea that it's going to sort of prevent issues that sort of pop up and and what users would expect because we test in a sort of full stack right we test in that browser so that we can see the interaction that occurs when things happen but end to end des testing isn't perfect right at the end of the day if i have a, if i implement a delay for my server for an api for instance that's not going to give me the user behavior right I, i'm really just testing to see what my application does and whether that test fails or passes as opposed to my user saying, well, at three seconds, I'm bailing on your application, right? It, it doesn't tell necessarily the entire user story, correct? I mean, that, that, that is true. I mean, it sounds like you're, that would be more like a UX test, which I'm not sure any robot could necessarily perform. Um, so, you know, I, 
I don't know. You know, there there are a lot of different ways, a lot of different approaches. I mean, that is why some companies have you know QA engineers to do more like acceptance testing, which is that okay, yes, these two these two robots talk to each other correctly, but does it really solve the problem that we're trying to solve with our site? And I, I don't think any mis, any automation framework is going to be able to to do that. There is still a need for the human touch. Sure, and I think I, I think that's where a lot of developers. I think there's a gap in sort of knowledge when it comes to end-to-end -end testing or even unit testing about what the purpose of that thing actually is. Where you say, hey, um, I want to test this small portion to make sure that my return is meets my test. Um, where things are actually happening, and for developers, that's nice because we understand that. We understand that the end result of that target is this output. Um, but we, that doesn't necessarily... Con conceive of what our users experience, right, as an, as an overall whole, where uh, we want, you know, if, if there's a bug that pops up, yet none of my tests are failing, right, is, is that a bug, right? So we have to triage that accordingly. So I think a lot of times developers, as we as developers, and I'm as guilty as this as anybody, is that my tests are not failing, so it's all good. But at the end of the day, we have to ship for users, which means we sort of have to mishmash these things together. And I think for a lot of people, end-to-end -end helps that as well, right? We, you use bits and pieces, whether that's acceptance testings or QA, to sort of bring together a really sort of uh, cohesive approach to developing and shipping really nice software. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say the biggest deliverable of an end-to-end -end test or an integration test is just, you know, so much more coverage than, say, what, what a unit can, can give you. I don't know if you've ever seen, like, that, that YouTube video that went viral a while ago, and it was, like, two doors that someone installed. And it was, like, both of them uh, can, like, function, right? You can, like, twist their handle, open and close them, but the moment that you try to do them at the same time, like, as soon as you try to actually open one door, it hits the other door, and therefore its basic function, you know, falls apart. So it's like, the, you know, the caption is like, two unit tests, no integration tests. So I don't know, yeah. And, it's and great test. video. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, great video. So uh, I, I would just say, you know, why you would even want to do end-to-end -end testing is you get, you get massive amounts of coverage in the perspective of a user. If your if you're end-to-end test or your integration test pass, I mean, you can be pretty confident that overall, you know, your services is working as expected. That's great. Um, so I, I actually have, um, so we, it's, it allows you to do more intelligent testing, right? So you can kind of hybridize your integration and end-to-end -end tests. So you can kind of mock things when you need to, not mock things when you don't want to, and it lets you do that in one, you know, with, with one tool, right? Essentially writing the same set of tests, perhaps even in the same described block. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you could, you could simply have the feature uh, as an end-to-end, -end, um, and then within that, and then have, and then mock it a bunch of different ways so that you can control the environment and you can control the situation uh, and, and basically cover both halves. You have confidence that it is working completely, like really pulling uh, the results from the server to get back your JSON or what have you uh, versus simulating it um, in order to test all of the different edge cases. Um, definitely. Yeah, no, that, that sounds really powerful. Um, and, and so I have a question just a little bit lower level, um, just about, you know, so how, how developers can, um, you know, so Glad talked about, you know, being able to easily get it into your projects, um, but what's the learning curve, right? So with, with the API as well as, you know, how can, how can people leverage existing tests, right? Written in Mocha or Jasmine, um, you know, um, to, 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 use, to use Cypress. Yeah, I think that's a great question, and, and it is a challenging answer. Um, I would say that if you have an existing test suite in Selenium, um, I mean, it's fairly easy to port those over, but nothing you're not going to get anything for free. Uh, I mean, there is definitely a learning curve. Um, hopefully, we're onboarding you and slowly revealing it to you, or you know, we even have some plans to like try to gamify it, and sort of make testing a lot more fun and interactive, and something that sort of you can just sort of have like a boot camp to get through to like, have to achieve these things. But it's it's not going to be free. I mean, we're we're built on top of Mocha, so all that existing Mocha knowledge is going to transfer directly over. Like how you organize and split up your tests is going to transfer over. We're built on top of Chai, so 
assertions will, for the most part, feel about the same. Uh, we're built on top of sign-on, so doing your mocking and stubbing and using those libraries uh, will feel about the same. But, I mean, there's definitely a learning curve, and uh, I, I don't think we've done, like, any, any studies, per se. We sort of have ad hoc data to suggest sort of, like, where the drop-off point for developers. And, I don't know, it's just something that we're going to have to work on and, and improve. Cool. Yeah, that's that's always a, that's always a tough thing because you guys are in uh, like a, you're in like a closed beta or something like that right now, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and so and I guess I kind of want to talk a little bit about this. I mean, Cypress is is constantly evolving and changing. And you know, we right now like we serve to get Cypress, you download a like a desktop application that is built for your operating system, right? And um, and right away that that kind of feels a little unfamiliar. It's kind of like, wait a second, I download an app, but what, don't I just check this into like my dev dependencies or something? Because that's like what I do with other tools. And so we're, we're basically packaging it because that achieves what, what we need to sort of prove out right now. There's zero dependencies. It will run everywhere on everyone's machines no matter what. And, there's, and you basically have to do very little. But of course, like, especially when we go full-blown open, it's publicly accessible. The entire desktop app is going to be open source. In fact, many components are already open source. But you're also going to be able to just check it in as a dev dependency. That is definitely something that we're going to be doing. Um, it's just that you have to keep in mind that like not everyone has a, a node project. And in fact, like only about a third of our users right now uh, use, use node primarily as their back end. So you know, we, we sort of had to experiment with well, how, then, okay, if we can't just, you know, expect, like, a node ecosystem to, to adopt this, then, you know, we've got to try out other things. And packaging as a desktop application was sort of, like, the, the zero-day solution. But it, it's not going to be how it, I mean, it, it's going to change. You're going to be able to check it in like everything. I mean, and I imagine that's one of the things that you guys are constantly, the, the types of feedback you guys are constantly looking into now as well from, you know, from people like Gleb and, uh, and other, other folks and companies that you have uh, working with that stuff. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have a Gitter channel. People can come in. We work really closely with our early adopters. We have several companies where their whole front-end team uses Cypress, and so we're regularly pairing with them and screen sharing and looking at their solutions. I mean... Cypress now has been in development for two years, and in that time, I mean, it's been used on hundreds of projects, and so it constantly evolves and sort of uh, uh, reshapes itself to best fit the environments that it's essentially attempting to solve. So it's not like something that just got developed in a vacuum that was only really built to solve my limited perspective of building web apps. It has been shifted and reshaped incrementally, little by little, uh, to match what the general market needs. Uh, Brian, can I ask uh, you a quick question? Sure. Uh, how large is Cypress team, and what's the roadmap or timetable for the general release? Yep, so we actually just hired our fifth full-time person uh, on Monday, so the team size is five. Um, we will absolutely, without a doubt, have a public release in 2016. There's no question about it there are just very core specific things that are missing that when we go live, we have to have in place. Uh, I mean, our, our bigger goals are really to become an entire ecosystem. You know, other tools have come close. You know, if you look at Karma, you have, you know, a lot of plugins, a lot of ecosystem around that. You can look at Gold, you can look at Crunt, you can look at, you know, different frameworks and whatnot. And that is our goal as well. Like, we want Cypress to be extensible. Uh, we want it to be extremely well documented with screencasts, with animated GIFs, basically walking you through this whole thing. Um, and we want it to be completely open source. I mean, it, ultimately, we're trying to be champions for the open source community and web developers at large. Uh, we want you to use it on open source. We want you to use it at work. Um, and to do that, we really have to sort of uh, uh, meet the needs and expectations that this community has sort of come to adopt when uh, when it's trying to uh, gain you know critical mass and adoption. Great. So we've mentioned a few things that just that, that Cypress does for you. Um, 
and talked a little bit about you know like helping you stub out uh, your API calls and and things like that. Um, can we talk a little bit about or just kind of like you know some bullet points of what some of the main features that Cypress gives you straight out of you know, straight out of the box? Uh, sure. Um, I think you know Gleb sort of talked on uh, a few of them, but I'll, I'll sort of just highlight on some of the biggest ones. Like the moment that you open up a Cypress project and start testing, you'll immediately notice that as you use our API and as you issue commands like a real user, like DOM traversal, find this element, interact with this, walk up, walk down, click, double click, uh, type, all those things. Every every command that you issue is actually uh, we call it like a command log. So we have, you know, our own runner. So if you, when I say runner, I mean like if you were to use Mocha in a browser, right? You get you get like the, you, you know, you're inside of a inside of a browser. You see the see the tests appear with a check mark and a hex and a total tally, and um, you see them complete and whatnot. So we we have our own runner view, and that's what we call the web app. Like Cypress, you know, even though it's a desktop app, that's where you launch your projects. But once you're inside of a project, you're just inside of a web application. And you know we're going to list off all of your tests. We're going to tell you about the configuration of Cypress, and then as you run tests, like they're going to show up on the left side, and you can expand the test to basically see a history of every single command that was run. And we automatically organize it things like you know obviously with Mocha you have before, before each, after, after each hooks. Like we'll automatically organize the commands that ran based on the life cycle of the test. And every single command provides you this incredible amount of value to basically see what happened in a test. Because, you know, arguably, we sort of touched on this point earlier, but why is end-to-end -end testing so hard? Well, I mean, for a lot of reasons. With the first primarily being when something fails, you have no idea what the hell the preceding conditions were that actually led up to the point of failure. I mean, it's, it's basically like a black box and, you know, with with Phantom JS and other things like that, you can't even see what actually happened, which which is just sort of ludicrous. So one of the things with Cypress is, is that as you issue commands that you know generally mutate the state of your application, you can hover on these and basically walk back in time to look at what the DOM snapshot was. And certain commands that have mutating uh, abilities, like a click, well, we realize well when you when you're clicking something, you're actually you really need two states. You need like as the click was happening state and then the post click state. And other commands even have, you know, three states. And so uh, as you're hovering over command, it will automatically shift, you know, before and after. It'll shift through all the different states that we captured as that command was being executed. Um, and of course, like just clicking on a command as they're logged provides you like all of the output of sort of what happened, like how many elements we found, whether we found an element. Um, and each, all that information is shaped particularly to the different types of commands. So, you know, if you're doing things like XHR uh, mocking, uh, we, we, we will display to you sort of like a routing table that tells you, like, you've told when requests go out that, that meet these specifications to automatically, like, route them to specific responses. We'll, we'll display all that for you. Um, and, I mean, there's just, you can kind of go crazy here. Like, we, we've sort of experimented with a lot of different ways to visually show you this. But the whole, the whole difference is that you have, like, just visual data that you can immediately look at and understand what the conditions were that led up to something. And, um, and to, it's going to feel really natural um, uh, to you as a, as a web developer. Um, so, I mean, really, that's just like one, that's like one feature, I would say. Uh, but obviously, it's very different. Like, not no other tool offers that. Um, some other things, I mean, I'd basically just say uh, there's no flake and there's basically no waiting in Cypress. Uh, waiting is, is a side effect of basically not really knowing what's going on. And anytime that you couple your test to a specific wait, you are uh, introducing inherent flake. And instead of ever having to wait, you basically just describe the state of your application. Like what is, what is the final state that I desire this application to be in in order for this to pass? And Cypress will basically just automatically, intelligently retry, and it will understand what you're ultimately trying to do, and it will potentially alter its behavior in the moment that your application actually reaches that state and knows to pass and move on. So I'd say there's a lot of, um, I mean, it, it has been incredibly difficult to write this API. This is the hardest API I've certainly ever written. 
Um, but for users using it, it's, it's really simple to do. Uh, can I add something to Brian's uh, points? Of uh, course. So, Brian, yes, definitely. You don't have to write timeouts or wait, you know, browser wait kind of five seconds when you uh, type, you know, use Cypress. And we have so many browser wait commands in Selenium tests, it's not even funny. And it's not even funny when we have a variable say, that says like short delay, and it used to be one second when it became five seconds, and now it's like 10 seconds. Um, but going back to your first point, you know, your runner is just amazing. And, you, you know, your application, your little proxy, when it runs, it creates a proxy server, and then you can open multiple browsers and execute your test in all different browsers on your local machine. You can even open, like, mobile browsers on your tablet and point to you at URL. And every time you change a test, all the browsers will run it again. So you, you literally have unbelievable cluster, and you can debug cross-platform, like, locally very easily. And um, Brian described that every action is there in a runner, and it's amazing when, for example, there is, like, type text. And if you hover or you click on that command in a runner, the browser will actually show you what highlighted DOM elements, because it takes snapshots before, you know, during, after states, and you can literally debug at that particular moment what the state of a DOM was, you know, what the state of a data was. And to me, this is a huge, because to me, the value of a test, end-to-end -end test, is not when it passes like 5,000 times in a row. The value of a good test is when it fails, can I debug it quickly? And every time I use a Selenium test and it failed, I had to go into the code, I had to put like browser.debug or something, I had to open a browser, I had to go to some specific URL I could never remember. And then I could start debugging and actually looking around what actually failed. But if I let browser go on, I could never come back and inspect what actually the previous step value was, because I was too late. And so ability to inspect the DOM and the data for each action before and after is just incredible experience. Yeah, to uh, Gleb's point, I, I actually forgot about this, but when you issue actions like a user, like click or type or whatever, we will also show you a hitbox on the DOM. Not only will we highlight the element that sort of, which, you know, when you're querying, you know, query for this button will highlight, you know, one or multiple elements that we found. When you issue actions, we'll actually display a little red dot, which is the hitbox of exactly the coordinates where that action took place. And furthermore, when you click on commands, things like type, for instance, we, um, because Cypress lives in the same run loop, it knows what happened to the event propagation, and therefore we can display things like whether your event uh, was prevented default or whether its default action was canceled or, you know, in the, in the uh, situation of type, you know, even what car code and what events fired did the input event uh, fire. Um, things like that. So basically, it, it is like, it's almost very complementary to DevTools itself, and it sort of reaches in and is able to tell you about sort of the, the core details of, of an event and bubble those out to help you, you know, understand what may or may not have happened. That's really, really powerful. I'm, I'm now excited to see this UI. <laughs> um, I have a really quick question about how, how web components and web component testing and, and, and how kind of Cypress uh, wraps around that with, you know, encapsulation or, or shadow DOM, et cetera. Um, any support for that? Um, that is, uh, I do not know. <laughs> uh, I, will, I will admit, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't think that we would have any problems with this. I mean, we have problems with iframes right now, although that's going to be solved, and I have some experimentation in the, or some experiments in the works to basically show that. Um, I mean, there, the way that Cypress works is technically substantially more, it's, it's so much harder to get right than the way that Selenium works, um, but the payoff is huge. And um, I imagine uh, with web components, as long as you can, as long as they're accessible, 
from window or document will be able to handle them, but I, I don't actually have any use cases or experiments to show how that will or will not work. Um, my guess is, is that if Selenium works with them, then we will work with them, and as long as it's part of the browser's native Uh oh. Uh, I think Ryan. we Ryan, did we lose you? <laughs> I think we may have. That's fine. We we truck on. I'm sure he'll be back. I drop again. Sorry. Oh, like yeah, a long no, you're back. Oh yeah, no, just, so, just, just back up a few minutes. Okay. Not so a few the, minutes, like a minute. Okay. Well the question was about Just start uh, the whole podcast over. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so the question was about uh, web components and basically how we will handle that. And um, uh, I, I actually don't know. I don't have any uh, use cases or experiments or any users that have uh, ever raised a flag. And uh, maybe that's because maybe it naturally works. But basically, I was just saying that um, if Selenium can do it, then I mean, then uh, then by rote, automatically we will be able to do it. It just may require some massaging. And I gave an example of. Um, that right now sub nested iframe support is not built into Cypress, um, but we will be able to solve that as well. It's just that some things that come down the pipe we might have to, you know, s specifically support because the way that Cypress works is very different than Selenium, and it is much, 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 much harder to actually execute everything. Um, but uh, but as long as you know the the uh, the uh, uh, Shadow DOM is accessible from window or document. It should work just fine. I just have to say that it makes me sad that nested iframes of any type still exist in certain scenarios. I understand why they exist there, but at the same time, sorry, that's just a diversion. You said nested iframes, and I shippered inside. Yeah, so, um, you know, through sort of, I guess, my own personal journey of Cypress, I have, uh, I've had to go way, way, way back in time and reading you know, specs from the 90s about basically how browsers actually work and I've discovered all sorts of crazy things that I never knew existed, but basically that there is a spec and documentation for. And actually, uh, iframes, although they were abused for a long time, are an incredible thing for browsers to be able to do. Just so, it is so difficult to implement an iframe from the host's perspective. Um, and um, I'll just say that, I mean, yeah, there's still plenty of use cases. I mean, just think of, uh, think of when you want to add uh, billing to your site. Um, unless you want to deal with DCI compliance, one of the best ways to do it is just uh, to basically embed an iframe that comes from, you know, Braintree or, or whatnot. Um, so the, the use case is absolutely legitimate. Um, and it's been fun basically figuring out ways to support it. And, and building test frameworks as a general rule of thumb can be, as you've just pointed out, really, really difficult. Um, how long have you guys been working on Cypress? Um, I have been working full-time on Cypress for almost two years now. And before Cypress, before I even realized that it was going to become Cypress, I had experimented with sort of the, the technology around it before that for probably at least a year. Um, the moment that I sort of created Cypress or realized I wanted to do this full time was actually, I was sitting at a talk at a JS Comp, and I don't know, it just, it just suddenly hit me that I realized I was thinking sort of like about how we were doing certain things at, uh, at the job that I was at, and I realized I could actually build this into an entire service that could work for everyone, that could work for no matter what you were doing. And then when I had that, I spent um, the first six months just technically proving it out, like running experiments to see if it was possible. And then it's just sort of like the adjacent possible, you know, when you sort of realize one thing is and you just make incremental improvements after, you know, a couple of years of development, now you're sort of uh, a whole galaxy further ahead than really uh, anything that's happened previously. But it's all just small incremental stuff. Um, I'll, I'll also just kind of say that, you know, uh, we as a team, um, we're, we're based here in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, I realized that to do this well and to really solve testing, 
um, required like the whole service and the platform side of it where you have to like really spin up browser instances and whatnot and and basically like to Gleb's point earlier he's basically talking about how uh, when something fails like you need the tools you need the data available in order to figure out why something failed and although we've like put together a really incredible innovative local testing experience um, that only really still solves the single developer working on a project and we have yet to truly solve what it takes to run tests over a team in CI and like right now you know we're still just using basic local reporters in CI to where when something fails you basically get a stack trace and albeit you get a really damn good stack trace and there's a lot of information in that error message that's way better than anything else but really what you need is you need the ability to have those snapshots or those screenshots and you need the ability for all those commands to basically be rebuilt as a tree to where when you can go and review when something failed it basically feels exactly the same as local and when you want to iterate on that failure instead of you iterating on it locally you can actually iterate it in CI on the machine that it's running at and to do that requires a whole host of things so I guess making my, my point is, is that I realized this last year and I realized I'm going to need a pretty substantial team to do this so we raised uh, venture capital money here in Atlanta Georgia um, at the end of last year and so now this team is five we're likely going to grow more we're likely going to raise a series A uh, the question is is just basically how much in order to build out this service Sounds like you need Redux. <laughs> uh, yeah, the uh, Cypress code base is it's kind of insane. It is, um, it's huge. And yes, Redux or even RxJS has been uh, on our radar to update the driver um, to redo it. It basically just uses promises top to bottom. Uh, but there's a lot of massive amounts of managing state. It's pretty, it's pretty crazy. Uh, to your point about how do you write a testing framework, that how do you test a testing framework? Uh, it's really difficult. Um, uh, it's actually interesting if you look at like Mocha specs, how it tests itself. It sort of assumes it to already sort of exist and be there. But like if you break something in Mocha core, it kind of breaks all of its own tests because it's no, no longer able to do the thing that it does. Um, but we actually we actually dog food uh, Cypress on our own Cypress projects to where uh, many of our UIs that we use in Cypress are actually tested with Cypress itself, uh, and then all of our like backend services and stuff it's all Node it's, it's JavaScript top to bottom and so we don't we don't use Cypress for that obviously we just use uh, Mocha and all the typical tools we've already talked about. I think we've got a couple more questions for you. Um, yeah, I jumped on late. Sorry, guys. I have uh, I have just one one question about this. I don't want to embarrass myself since I don't know what was said or whatever. So <laughs> I'll just <laughs> I'll just come in and say, you know, you said you wanted to scale and uh, and move out, and it's software as a service, um, and you do have it on on uh, GitHub. So that's awesome that you know we can actually build it on our our own servers. I'm assuming, right? But what what is the plan for scale? T you know, to have um, as far as like what what is going to be able to be available on GitHub? Um, yeah, for great, free. Great question. Um, I mean, this is this is so core to our model. I mean, our I mean, for us, for Cypress to really work, it has to work for the community. It has to be right in line with everything else that we've come to love and adopt. Um, and I, I mean, I guess I'll just say that right now the core desktop product is has not been open sourced, and there's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of complexity around uh, around that. But when it is actually released publicly, the whole code base, top to bottom, for the desktop component is going to be open source. So, um, and it will always be and forever be free to use locally. Like it's it's software that you install on your machine. It's resources that you're using. Like we just want to be that experience for, for for that, right? Like I mean, obviously you can fork it, you can make whatever modifications to it that you want, and um, and you know we want to create like an ecosystem that makes it highly extensible for people to write plugins and stuff. However, when you are running in CI, there is no way of getting around it. You have to spin up real browsers 
in the cloud or otherwise and manage this and, and, and automatically like parallelize like the tests across those. And there is a massive amount of data that you have to aggregate, that you have to parse, that you have to analyze, that you have to capture, and then you have to make available back. That part is going to be where our service comes in. And trust me, you do not want to try to do this by yourself. It is incredibly difficult and it is not, it is not cheap in order to build. Um, that, that's the part that we're gonna be charging for. Um, to run private projects, right? But of course, all the open source stuff, we're going to run those for free. Um, and then also, I mean, sort of the follow-up, the follow-up answer to this is that if you look at like uh, Sauce Labs and Browser Stack, and we get this question a lot, which is like, what is your plan for cross-browser testing? Because that is a very, very important one. And um, when you think about this, like, and, you know, I, I've talked to Sauce Labs a lot. I, I, I've talked to BrowserStack. I've used both of them. I mean, they have big engineering teams, they, which are mostly operations. It is no joke to be able to spin up, like, seven or 800 different combinations of browsers. I don't know if you've ever looked at, like, the licensing for OSX. It is kind of, it is totally crazy. There's a, there's a reason why you can't spin up OSX machines, you know, in uh, Google Compute Engine or, or AWS and whatnot. And we do not want to do that. You know, if, if I said, like, oh, the whole thing's on hold until we, like, replicate all this infrastructure, it would take forever. So what we're going to do is you're just going to be able to give us your API key into them, and we will automatically be able to run across their grid. So that means that a big part of Cypress, and one of the reasons that it hasn't been open source yet, is we're basically backporting in Selenium functionality and capabilities, although I, I think we're going to do it much, much, much better than... Um, how other providers have done that. Um, I mean, like, we, like, actually understand how the drivers work and how, like, Selenium standalone is different than the way that the drivers work and et cetera, et cetera. So you're going to be able to give that to us, and then we're still, I'm still, we're still going to, like, manage the builds, and we're going to automatically pull out those assets, and we're going to automatically serve them back to you. So we're still going to create a seamless experience around that. Um, one of the the awesomest features that we've been working on, which is going to be totally insane and crazy, but it works, is right from within Cypress itself, you're going to be able to spawn cross-browser instances right from within Chrome, and but actually use Cypress from Chrome, and it's automatically remotely synchronized with the other instance. So, like, that, that's another pain point of testing is that, like, when something does fail in a cross-browser, you know, you've got to go out and sort of spin it up and may, maybe manually play around with it. And it just doesn't match, like, that same experience that you have, like, when you're initially writing your tests. And with this, what basically happens is that you still get all the report or all the feedback inside of Chrome, even stack traces that are automatically rewritten to where you can, like, inspect them with the Chrome dev tools. But yet it's going to be driving, you know, IE 11 that's in the cloud somewhere, you know, potentially spun out by, by soft labs or browser stack. And uh, so it's basically like we're just, we're just integrating and sort of using the resources that are available to us into like a full comprehensive, you know, testing uh, suite that really works. Sounds like you guys are doing a lot of heavy lifting. Yeah, so, you know, you need, you need a team of uh, developers to do that. So that, that is the logic of sort of the progression of what we've done. But if you were masochistic, right, you could put it all on your own servers and try that if you so desire to be in pain forever. Uh, <laughs> I mean, yes, you, you can run your own... You can support play. people and all that. I mean, you can run Selenium Grid yourself, but, you know, there's sort of but a reason why we use software as a service. <laughs> Because it is generally much more expensive to redesign and redevelop and manage all of that than it is to just use a provider. But of course, you're free and it's open source, so go ahead, go ahead. Um, actually, um, realistically, we'll probably offer like an on-premise uh, image or something like that. That's that's sort of the new way of of handling that. I'm sure there's going to be users, big corporations with ridiculous requirements and restrictions on their code, and I'm sure that's something that we will handle. 
Uh, so I'm going to try to squeeze in the last question, by the way. And it's been so such a pleasure, like learning about this awesome framework that you know clearly solves a lot of problems in a, in, a, in, a, in an intuitive way. Um, so this is maybe a combination for Glove and, and yourself. Um, I'm, I'm really interested to know how fast it is to run these tests. We've talked about it's easy to run, right? It's easy to easy to write, easy to run. Um, uh, comes with all these features, but is it fast? And also, you know, are these synchronous or asynchronous? Can we run tests, you know, um, concurrently? Um, I don't even know if I is that the right word? Con concurrently? Yeah, 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 ab absolutely. Four languages, it's a little hard sometimes. So. <laughs> Well, yeah, running um, like Ava, the new uh, test runner that's sort of like a uh, competitor Mocha, you know, we're now... Yeah, Ava. Gonna, yeah. so um, running in a browser is just different. There, it is impossible to do that inside of a browser. I mean, well, it's not impossible, but basically, you know, there's only one document, and um, it, it would basically be impossible to run tests concurrently. With that said, however, that's one of the things like that's part of our service, right? Like when you're running it in CI, we're automatically going to, instead of spinning up one browser, we're going to spin up like 10 browsers and we are going to automatically manage, you know, splitting up your tests across them. But it's still done by file. You know, there's, there's like no getting around. You cannot, you know, once you've built the tree of specs, be able to like shift some of these off to something else. And especially not when you're running it locally, you would, you literally need X n number of browser instances. Um, but when it comes to speed, just generally, locally, I mean, it is basically as fast as the browser can physically render. It, the bottleneck is not Cypress. It is, it is basically the browser's capability. Um, it doesn't, like, respawn instances between tests. It, it basically, like, intelligently blows away the state of, of the previous one. Like, there's, a, like, a reset lifecycle. Um, it automatically watches your test files using, you know, all the standard uh, uh, file watching uh, libs. It uses uh, Chocodar under the hood. So, you know, file changes get picked up, you know, within like 100 milliseconds, and it's basically going to instantly blow away everything that's happening and, and rerun the test. Ideally, your tests reload and complete sub-second. Um, I've seen a lot of users of Cypress, and not everyone is, like, doing that. There are still, like, plenty of, like, anti-patterns that you can do that cause long feedback loops of, like, 45 seconds or something before you get to a pass or fail. But um, it is there to be able to get sub-second uh, responses. And, like, when we're writing our own tests internally, that's pretty much how the feedback loop feels. So really for the first time, what this does is, like, instead of developing, instead of, like, writing your code in development environment and having Chrome open, and refreshing, or if you you know you're using the latest tools, sometimes you know you can even not have to refresh and rebuild your state. But really, what, what Cypress wants to do is it wants to replace dev. It, it wants you to just test and dev all at the same time. And it, as long as there's not like a context switch, as long as you still have access to all your same dev tools, you can all your you know the capabilities of the debugger. Um, then, then you can really do both at the same time. You can TDD uh, or, or even sort of like experiment. You could like drive the browser to do a couple of things that you want to automate and then go hack on your feature. And then when you're done with that, instantly like finish your test. So you're sort of getting this incremental test dev, test dev, test dev. And that is 100% possible with, with what Cypress does right now. Cool. Well, we're just about out of time for this episode. Brian Gleb, thank you so much for being on the show. Where on the internets and the intertubes can the wonderful people find you? Oh, um, I mean, they can just go to Cypress.io, fill out an early adopter form, get on our mailing list. Um, preferably, though, they can just uh, join our Gitter channel, you know, gitter.im slash Cypress.io. Um, they can also find the information on our repos and whatnot. And, you know, just come in and, and chat or, you know, use it and uh, give us feedback. And uh, we'd be happy to, uh, happy to talk to you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, people can find me at my personal website, gliabachmutov.com, my first and last name together, or at uh, Bachmutov on Twitter. I, I got lucky to snatch my last name. <laughs> We will make sure to put all these links and information into the show notes because generally I can't spell. So this always generally helps get things where they are. 
Yeah, Glab also has like a very serious blog for you know, and and a bunch of slides that are awesome from all his you know talks and whatnot. So it's a great resource. Thank you. And at my blog, uh, there's a blog post about Cyprus, which kind of kicked it off this conversation. Awesome. Um, and uh, so if you can, like, actually put a link in our doc, and we'll make sure that gets out as well. Will do. Well, thanks for having me. Wonderful host. Do you have any parting words as we close out this episode? No, I just, uh, just thank, again, same as everybody said, thank you both very much. It's been very informative. I actually just uh, finished filling out, I'm working on filling out the uh, Cypress IO early adopter form thing now, so, <laughs> so that hopefully I can play around with it. So, uh, but, yeah, just thank you for coming on. Likewise, it was, it, was, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Well, this has been another episode of the Web Platform Podcast. We hope to see you next week. Bye, everybody. Bye.